Yesterday, we had uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah J. Johnston on. He is the author of a book called Body of Proof. He is a, uh, he's got his uh, doctorate, but so do I. So, I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> no, I'm a doctor of, of uh, humanities, and I, I didn't even study for the test. But uh, he's also the president of Christian Thinkers Society, Preston Baptist Church. Uh, and we were talking yesterday about the Shroud of Turin, which surprised me because a, a lot of people, especially in the South, Baptists and, and, and evangelicals, they don't necessarily hold to the traditions of the Catholic Church. Um, and I, I think we all have unbelievable pieces of the puzzle. And one of those pieces, I think, is, is the Shroud of Turin. And uh, I didn't know what to think about it until a few years ago. But uh, he's he's writing a whole book on the Shroud of Turin, so we thought we would bring him back today. This is the burial cloth uh, of Jesus Christ. That's what it's purported to be, the burial cl cloth. And it is a, a reverse negative. It is almost like when his body came back to life, this is the way I view it, his body came back to light, uh, life, it, it's like the... Uh, the burial cloth was like a film, uh, and it printed in a burst of light, it printed the negative of his body in that cloth. And nobody really knows how it was made if it is fake. Jeremiah, welcome to the program. Glenn, it's great to be back with you. And I'm sure we have people that right now they're like Thomas Didymus. Remember Thomas the twin that he said in John 20, verse 25, Hey, look, you can say Jesus is God, good for you. But unless I see his nail-scarred hands, mm -hmm. unless I can put yeah. my hand in his side... I won't believe. Well, guess what we're going to do today on the Glenn Beck program? You're going to be able to actually see the nail-pierced hands of Jesus, thanks be to the Shroud of Turin. Okay, so explain the history of the Shroud of Turin, of where it came from, when do we think that it first appeared? <clears throat> Absolutely. And so let's and let's make sure we situate this because you bring up a really important point. There has been a pejorative vibe towards the shroud by anyone who isn't Catholic. I want to remind our audience, the Catholic Church, they're the largest landowners on earth. Did you know that? They actually have a lot of land. <laughs> yeah. They have a lot of yeah. assets yeah. and property. And guess what? It turns out they have some yeah. excellent artifacts for the Christian faith. C.S. Lewis. It's amazing. We've all heard of C.S. Lewis. I love Lewis. I lived in Oxford yeah. for three years. Glenn, I didn't know it until this year. Jack Graham, my pastor, and I went to Oxford on an inspirational summer trip, and then we went up and did some golfing at St. Andrews. We literally mm -hmm. went to Lewis's home. And I look up on Lewis's home. I don't know if you can see this, but for the benefit of our audience, yeah, I'm holding it right next to our foot, my face. I look up, C.S. Lewis kept a picture of the Shroud of Turin in his bedroom next to his bed where he slept. And the reason he did that, Lewis said, I needed a reminder every morning and every evening that my God has a face. And so we're not talking about something weird or French here. Even C.S. Lewis took it seriously. So... When did it first appear on the scene? The, this is what's remarkable about it. The Shroud of Turin goes back far beyond the radiocarbon dating. And as you point, because, I mean, some people hear Shroud, they're like, what is that? As you pointed out, this is a burial garment for Jesus. All four Gospels say that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two members of the Sanhedrin, remember if the Sanhedrin contempt, condemned a criminal to death, it was, according to the Mishnah, the Sanhedrin had to bury the condemned criminal. What do we see in the juridical procedure of Jesus. Two members, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they take Jesus and they wrap his body in a burial garment and they bury him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. It's not like when you think of, you know, wrapping a body, you think of like a mummy. Right. Uh, but this is actually like a very long tablecloth. Right. Very, very long. Um, and it's uh, they laid it down, then put the body in and then where the head is, they took and they pulled that the rest of the fabric down to his feet. So it is a double image 
of the back, then a space, and then the front exactly. of this body. Exactly, and that is not unusual. If you were into Jewish burial traditions, you would do that. And you might say, oh, Glenn, Jeremiah, there's no way that a burial shroud could last for 2,000 years. Give me a break. Well, actually, when you are a student of history, you can see we even have a Tarkan dress linen shirt. And guess what, Glenn? It's 3,200 years older than the Shroud of Turin. It's 5,000 years old. So given the right set of circumstances, linen will last forever. So you're exactly right. They laid, and it's a 14 feet long. It's about four feet wide, so longer than our studio table here at Mercury Studios. And what's fascinating is something occurred. And I, get, I have the top five reasons why I went from skeptic. I mean, Glenn, I was a total skeptic until I went and wrote Body of Proof, did the video series for the Bible study, Body of Proof in Jerusalem, went to the Shroud exhibit, exa- had private access, exhibited all, uh, looked at all the artifacts. And then I came out with top five reasons that utterly took me from skeptic to total okay. defender now so, of the Shroud. So let's share those. Number five. We're gonna let's do a countdown. You like countdowns, Glenn? Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> the Shroud of Turin is the most studied arty artifact of the archaeological world. There's not a close second. And the second thing I want to say is it's also the most light about artifact in the archaeological world. So we're not okay. Talking. So wait, let's start with. Let, let's start with the, the, the first one, which is the most studied. How, yeah. how, how do you know that and what has been done to it? Because I've read all the peer-reviewed journals, so you don't have to, Glenn. <laughs> There's been a, <laughs> an amazing um, evidential history of the Shroud of Turin. In 1978, the STIRP team, this is the Stroud, Stroud of Turin research project team, went to Italy. They thought it'd be a free trip to Italy. They were all having drinks in the lobby of the hotel, giggling that on the Catholic Catholic Church's dime. They were going to have a free trip to Italy. They only needed two days to prove that it was a hoax. And guess what? Nobody was giggling two days later. They had approximately 120 hours to examine this very ancient shroud, which has a very unique history. I mean, Hitler tried to steal it. They had to they had to save right. it from Hitler's hands during World War II. Right. I mean, the history of the shroud is just remarkable. So these were not Bible scholars. These were not, as far as I know, there were outside of the priests that were kind of security overlooking the shroud while it was being right. looked at. These were all weapon scientists. Barry Schwartz, who you interviewed, and I encourage everyone to go back and watch mm-hmm. the Glenn Beck interview with Barry Schwartz. He was a nominal Jew. Totally, His only bias was he thought it was a hoax and a joke when he went there. And now right. he's utterly right. convinced that it's not only not a hoax, because as we'll talk about in a minute, you can't, you cannot, if it's a hoax, it's never been repeated. He's convinced that it's an authentic burial shroud of Jesus. So it's the most studied cross-disciplinary artifact in the world. And the, in the, the, in 19, the 1970s, when Barry was part of this, as you said, they all went in in, as skeptics. And I believe it came out at the time that uh, it was possible but the radiocarbon data was saying no it's like you know a thousand years later or something but something was wrong and i don't remember what it was maybe you do barry yeah. said it was only until later when technology changed right that they right. realized oh my gosh this is that old yeah and and so 1978 you have the original research project and they come out and what they say is it's not a hoax there's no pigment there's no ink there's no dye the shroud has survived three fires it's been doused in water twice if it were if there was dye if there was paint it would have bled out it would have smeared so it's mm-hmm. it's nothing and, and essentially they came out and said it's not a hoax we don't know what it is 10 years later 1988 and this is point number three in the countdown which which we'll get to, the 1988 radiocarbon dating was done. So about 10 years after that original research project. Okay. All and right. this okay. is when all the headlines came out, Glenn, that said this is a total hoax. The carbon-14 dating dated it to the late 13th, early 14th century. There's huge problems with that, and we'll discuss that. Okay. So uh, number four. Number four, science today. And this is what really arrests my attention. Cannot explain how the image is in the cloth. Now, Glenn, you've seen the shroud. I mean, it, it's stunning. It, the energy it would have taken. I've what, never actually, 
I've never actually seen it in person. I was going to go to uh, tour, and I wanted to go this summer to tour and just to see it um, because talking to Barry Schwartz has to- totally changed my mind on it. Um, but you can't see it, it is, um, yeah, because it, it's it's protected. It's under a vault. They bring it out every every few years. It's at St. John the Baptist Cathedral in the Piedmont district of northern Italy, as you say, in Turin, Italy. By the way, if you go to Jerusalem, there's an incredible shroud exhibit there that shows every aspect of the shroud. But ro- I'm, I'm talking not just scientists in general. Rocket scientists, weapon scientists, chemical scientists cannot explain how the image is in the shroud. If it was a forgery, if it was a hoax, it's never been able to be repeated. I mean, this is unbelievable. These aren't Bible theologians or commentators saying it. They're scientists saying, we cannot explain how there's an image. And here's the fascinating thing, Glenn. Do you know if you get closer than eight feet, the image vanishes? You actually have to stand back from it at about eight feet to be able to fully see the image. It's very unique. 